Uh, my name is Paul Parkinson. I'm, um, I've been working in the same area of data and transaction processing since the 90s, so it's a one-trick pony uh, back in the 90s doing mainframes and then joined uh, Bluestone and uh, saw the Arduino transaction code and was in love, in love ever since. <laughs> Uh, and then I've been at Oracle, um, the transaction processing dev lead for like 18 years now, the middleware, you know, um, web logic, and now in the cloud, basically. So uh, I'm going to go over uh, staple microservice patterns in Kubernetes with Heldon and uh, database cloud services. And this is the safe harbor statement that we need to show, of course. And then the real kind of warning statement is that I do, I am guilty of having lots of slides. So I have a lot of information, um, and, but some of the slides are kind of just set up slides that I'll go through quickly, so it's not so bad. So I'm gonna do the presentation, and I have a seven minute demo. So I'll, so I'll go through these steps here. So, um, and a lot of this probably everyone's familiar with, but again, I'm trying to set this up. So just contrasting monolithic applications moving into this microservice world and some of the, the characteristics. Uh, you know, you have this uh, one giant monolith and you're generally going against one database, long release cycles, et cetera. Enter microservices, we have all of these advantages, but we, um, uh, you know, as far as scaling and development time, life cycles and things like that. But we do have cons and difficulties. And one of the major difficulties, no one seems to disagree, is the management of data. Just it's, uh, you know, increases in complexity when you start going to the cloud and microservices. So that's why I'm discussing it. So this is kind of, uh, you know, there's this wealth of cloud native uh, foundation technology. So I'm not gonna go through all of these right now, <laughs> but I'm going to go through those that are most related to Stateful and, and you know, what we're using as far as solutions. Yeah, so it is in phase. And obviously, you know, I think this is the right crowd for this slide. You guys are familiar with Kubernetes and, and why they might be good for uh, microservices. So at Oracle, we're, uh, you know, on the OCI s side of things, on the, the cloud infrastructure, um, we're creating this um, container native platform. So we have the Kubernetes environment, OKE, you know, if you're familiar with GK, uh, Oracle's OKE brings in all the resources, et cetera, to your Kubernetes environment. Uh, OCI registry um, for your images, security, tracing, and things like that, and uh, service brokers. So that's um, kind of what I'm gonna focus on in the next couple of slides. So uh, service brokers are the standard for bringing cloud resources into your Kubernetes environment. So this is the agreed upon standard for doing that. And so um, the basic approach is to connect to a given service broker, service vendor um, service broker, um, it, which is very easy. A uh, couple of commands, you know, your credentials or whatever for that cloud vendor. Um, and then you have a, a list of different classes and levels of cloud resources. So if we're in, for example, in Oracle, you know, we have an autonomous transaction database, and then, you know, it can be your basic enterprise HA version. So you choose from that, and either in the console or using cube control um, commands, you uh, select and provision or attach to something that's been provisioned already, and that brings a Kubernetes secret into your environment. And so it's as easy as that. You want a cloud resource, you attach. Now you have a, a Kubernetes secret, and a Kubernetes a secret is a, a resource in Kubernetes uh, that has all your security information. And in the case of an Oracle database, it has all your wallet, your, uh, your password, things like that. And so I'm going to describe Helidon a bit more later, but um, just to give an example of how easy it is, once you've pulled your secret in, you can then in your uh, Helidon microprofile config properties, um, mention the, the type of resource you want, data source, it's over here, uh, the name of it, and then what value do you want set on it, that is then pulled from your deployment, from your environment. So your, your secret is in Kubernetes, your deployment references that secret and sets it in your environment, and then your microservice automatically injects a data source pointing to, the, or whatever it may be, that resource may be, into your code. So super simple um, steps for setting that up and using it in your application. This is just a quick 
very quick mention of uh, the fact that uh, microservices in general are event driven. That's the, the, the um, forthcoming pattern. And so all of our products are using this cloud event standard, which is just really a, a format standard um, for communication. So just really just that, just to mention that. Uh, this is great because I can skip through this quickly. Ray covered this uh, very well. Um, service mesh is this cross-cutting concern. And I bring this in, I, you know, and this is the Envoy proxy he mentioned when we pilot um, and all of the, the, the various advantages. And this is great in general, but especially for stateful uh, web services, uh, pulling these out of these code, these common concerns out of the code into a service mesh is very valuable. And perhaps one of my, um, my favorite things about all of this is that um, data integrity in the cloud is so difficult that nothing's, get, nothing's become easier, it's all harder. <laughs> Except for tracing, that's something that's really become nice because I've always wanted tracing of these transaction propagation across these di various systems. And um, with Kubernetes in general, but especially the service mesh like Istio, you have tools like Tiali. So Tiali is a visual tool um, that pulls information from Istio and you can see an actual service call graph and we've actually developed beyond this. Both Kiali has, and I've developed a bunch of uh, items in Oracle as far as tracing. So you can see the call path, and along with that, the transaction path visually. So in the demo, this is a, a picture of the actual demo I'll show later. You have a front end contacting an order service, uh, contacting a shopping cart, and then um, we are actually adding tracing in the database. So you can have a trace from the front end all the way down to the database. It's really nice and we never had this before. And you're gonna need it <laughs> for, for some of these you know, debugging transaction integrity. Um, and then actually this is an older Kiali um, console as well. They've added a distributed tracing tab and that brings you into the realm of Jaeger. So you can start to drill down on open tracing that's captured in Jaeger or Zipkin. Um, and so we've added this across all the products. Um, we're, you know, we're pointing everything into these, uh, these Jaeger servers. And so you can see things, um, basically in just a 10 second overview of open tracing, there's two constructs, a uh, um, span, which are, there's a span, uh, there's a trace with spans and the spans are the calls between your services basically. It, it can be anything, but that's usually what it is. And then these spans have tags and baggage. So the tags are collected async and they're sent to the Jaeger collector for performance and things like that. And then your baggage is actually passed along the full call path. So you can pass things like transaction IDs and SOG IDs and things. So for debugging, this is great. You can really drill down and it's very nice. Uh, then I will just mention that there is a WebLogix uh, Kubernetes operator. Um, and so that just operators in Kubernetes, if you're not familiar, basically kind of take that role of an operator. It manages Kubernetes, and so we have a drop-in. We've done a lot of work on this. You can drop in uh, uh, web logic into a Kubernetes environment. And as all, uh, Ray also alluded to, we're writing a lot of operators and controllers. Controllers are the Kubernetes uh, resources that listen to those custom resource definitions he was mentioning. We're writing a lot of them in Java. So, you know, two years ago when I started with Kubernetes, I was definitely doing a lot of Go code learning that language. And it's nice to come back home to <laughs> Java because there's not really much lacking now as far as writing these operators and controllers in Java. Uh, so now I'll start to talk a bit about uh, what Helidon is. So uh, both of these are microservice frameworks and what we've done at Oracle is we've actually divided it into two flavors. So we have SE, which is a super lightweight, fast uh, framework with functional style, reactive, transparent, and has, uh, supports GraalVM. And then we have on the other side, Helidon uh, MicroProfile, which is a full implementation of MicroProfile as full CDI support. So instead of kind of putting them together and limiting one you know, limiting that single thing in any of these ways, we've kind of split it apart into, th into two areas. And then Helidon MP is kind of the um, kind of more natural smooth migration path from, uh, from Java E dev, so it's familiar to them. So it's, you know, micro profile. So 
uh, getting more into the details of what they have as far as stateful, um, uh, stateful uh, microservices. Uh, both have the tracing that I was mentioned, extended tracing for this. In um, Heladon Issy, we've we're developing, we have a DB client and I'm adding the messaging client um, functionality now, which makes uh, attaching to reactive DBs and messaging systems uh, very simple. So in Helen on SC, there are no annotations. It's all code. You know, there's nothing behind the scenes. It's kind of two different models in a number of ways. You know, like I say, that split, but also the fact that SC is not, there's no annotations. It's what you see is what you get type thing with the code. And then on the Helen MP side, we also have the tracing. We have traditional JTA, JPA support. We have uh, UCP support, so that's an Oracle database specific uh, driver. Uh, you can use it, for the, it's a generic connection pool, but what's really nice about it is it has features for the Rack database. So you get all of those features uh, and you know, in, a, in, a, in a rapid release. So we can release this in general more quickly than when blocking. So you get all those uh, Rack features. Uh, long running activities, which I'll elaborate on in a second. And then um, future Oracle DB feature integration, and these two features I'll talk about later on as well. So long running activities is a uh, spec that hopefully will be incorporated into um, your micro profile. Um, and I, I just put this one slide with annotations. I think it's kind of easiest to, to describe it in, in annotations. So uh, I, I will explain more about the different transaction models, but in, in microservices and in the cloud, we no longer can rely on uh, protocols such as JTA that uses uh, distributed locking, XA and two-phase commit. So we need to use um, patterns such as Sagas. And again, I'll elaborate on this, but uh, the spec that in the micro profile um, that will uh, provide that, provide a convention for it, and, uh, for demarcation, et cetera, and also interoperability is this long running activity spec. So we're going to provide this via the Nariana implementation in Helidon. And um, some of this will make more sense as I describe sagas, but basically, you know, a migration from JTA at transaction to this is what you'd be looking at. So uh, I'm gonna go over data management and then transaction management. So for both, uh, in microservices in the cloud, um, revisiting, <laughs> I say revisiting because a lot of these technologies are old and just they're coming into you know, um, a proper fit now with microservices, is the use of this data uh, domain-driven design. So you're designing based on these kind of logical boundaries instead of you know, this is the table that goes to this, this is the table that goes to that. So it's kind of a, a, a logical way and I'm discussing it in the context of data uh, now. So um, in the database, you would split this monolith along uh, these bounded contexts. So you're, s you're not separating it on you know, employee table and whatever account table, you're separating on accounts payable and accounts receivable, that type of bounded context. And so this is the best way to, to break up your data. And this is, um, is very important because whenever I hear a microservice fail story, it's usually at this level. So, you know, we ripped apart the database and now everything's messed up and microservices is a failure, you know, that type of thing. Uh, so it is kind of the, the over under thing where a lot of times it's okay, when you're, mo you're migrating, do the easy stuff first, the low hanging fruit, but then there's also the slowly tease out the database and look at the database usage because you know nine times out of 10, it, they're not using it the way they thought. Pick a table and see how that thing's really used and start to uh, you know, figure out what the actual domain driven design is, you know, what domains you have or don't have and work on that and then you know, work up to the business logic from there. So these are some of the microservice uh, data, data management patterns. Um, the first one, CQRS, uh, I'm going to go into a bit more later, but that's basically, it stands for uh, Command Query Responsibility Segregation. So instead of using the same API, like say JDBC, to insert, update, uh, and, and read your data, you separate those. They sh there's no need to couple those two. So you, you know, your um, actual commands to insert and things like that can be separate from your query as far as the API. So you, you know, everything decoupled, and I'll, like I say, I'll elaborate on that. Access through public APIs, that's obvious. 
um, API composition queries. This is a little tricky because you're talking about taking joins you may have had in the database and now that you have microservices that are split apart, um, you're talking about um, doing joins or logically arranging microservices so that you can use views and joins that are in the database. Uh, database per service, I'm gonna go into that a bit more. Uh, shared database and then a polyglot persistence, I'm gonna go into these more. So um, here the, the model for uh, microservices is a, a database um, per uh, microservice. But that does not need to be taken uh, literally necessarily, or at the very least, it does not need to be taken as the very first step. What the, what the, you know, the, that hard, fast rule is trying to say is make sure the data is isolated. And so that can be isolated in any number of ways, you know, even down to a table, schema, there's an Oracle feature for additions where you can work on different additions at the same time. Like I say, with views and uh, doing things in memory. So that's basically all that slide is saying is that you should have this one-to-one uh, -one relationship, but it doesn't necessarily need to be one database to one database. So there's also in the Oracle database, there's uh, this portal, portable database where we have one underlying shared container but then there are portable databases for each. Uh, they're completely separate and private, uh, but they sit on a basic core, so they're lightweight. So you can divide microservices to point to these portable databases. And the, the one of the big reasons uh, is, is basic design for microservices, but also the scaling argument to have, um, to have different databases for each service. And in some architectures, um, if you have something like portable databases, you still get the scaling. Uh, this is just talking about the fact that, um, uh, again, this is talking about Oracle Database, I'll, I'll be honest. <laughs> uh, just comparing the two models, you know, we have all these different databases that are um, unique for certain features that fit a particular need. Um, so there's advantages to that, but a lot of those in the Oracle Database, you know, we do have um, uh, support for these various different models. And if it's in the same database, you're eliminating all those different admin costs and XO protocol and things like that. And then this is just briefly touching on the fact that we're adding a asynchronous reactive support to Oracle Database. And looking forward, that's going to be using uh, the fibers and the loom. Uh, so I won't go into that in depth, but uh, that allows us to you know, put operations on different queues and be more efficient about connections because it's all async and reactive. Moving on to uh, transaction patterns, doing pretty well on time. Um, the communication between microservices, of course, is different from the old monolith days. So um, they, you've broken, broken everything apart so they communicate and you can do that via like file system, database, you know, conventional RPC, or uh, a, a, the you know, model for microservices is an async event-driven model. And that's where a lot of all this is moving. So um, again, as I mentioned, there's no locking um, as far as transaction protocols like XA or two phase commit. So we need um, new models to handle uh, data integrity that's now spread across these microservices. So we have event-based integration. Uh, here are some of the, the uh, you know, aspects of it and I'm going to focus on event sourcing and the uh, CQRS. So the, the basic model, and again, this is fairly old, but this is, has come into play as the model for uh, uh, microservices, is the use of event sourcing. So what this entails is uh, the fact that the, the, the operation that a microservice does results in not only that um, data being manipulated, but an event being sent that that, uh, about that manipulation of data so that any party microservice that's interested in that change can listen to that data. And you don't have this direct communication of one service to another. They just listen to the events they're interested in, keep what they need, organize it, and build up the, the information they need locally. Um, and uh, in the demo, I'll, I'll show kind of a, uh, an example of, of how that's advantageous. Again, command query responsibility uh, segregation is the fact that you may be inserting data using JDBC, but you're querying the data 
uh, via some other mechanism. And this ties into event sourcing because in event sourcing, that other mechanism is going to be the event. So uh, in, in the example, uh, we have an order service that inserts an order and the inventory service listens to that event and then reports whether it has enough inventory for that. And then in turn sends an event that the uh, order service picks up. Now that order service, and, and again, I'll show this more in the demo, can listen to any events it wants. So then when a customer goes and says, okay, I want information on this order, and you know, I want it to include shipping, suggested sales, all this other stuff, that order service is not doing this query across all these services. It has that information locally because it's been listening to the events that it was interested in, uh, in in the first place. So it's not doing the same kind of query it did to insert an order to query what the detail of the order is, and it's bringing it in from multiple sources. Uh, so you know, it cuts down on traffic, coupling, and again, you know, you get the domain-driven information that you want. So this uh, event sourcing pattern can be implemented in a number of ways. And um, uh, by the way, that LRA, just to go back to the uh, long-running activities, that's being designed in such a way that the underpinnings can be supported in multiple different ways. So I don't want to confuse people by you know, making it seem that they are orthogonal. It's a long-running activity, um, which you know, is a natural progression from JTA transactions or this event sourcing mechanism. They can work together. Or, um, or independently. Uh, but in order to achieve this event sourcing, again, you're whenever you manipulate data, you're sending an event. So you're doing two actions. So now we're back to this atomicity need. And so there are a few ways to go about this. And here are some of the techniques that are used in the field. So one is to, to use the uh, table as a messaging queue. So basically something is, whenever there's a change in the table, something is polling that queue. Well, there's a lot goes into that and it's very error prone. Um, the second approach is to use this outbox table pattern. And that's basically um, streaming uh, transaction logs. So in event sourcing, again, it's not necessarily, um, you know, you insert a row and the message sent is, you know, how many items are in that row or whatever. You're inserting a row and you're sending a, a message which can be of type order inserted, okay, and it has those details. So, you know, the format is not coupled in any way. Um, so for this outbox pattern, you, you, you can actually, you know, tail the transaction logs, and when the logs, you know, that delta that results in a message from the transaction logs, you know, streaming it with Kafka or whatever, is the way you can get this data manipulated plus message sent functionality. And then the third way, which is, um, uh, we're proposing an Oracle, of course, is the uh, Oracle Advanced Queue. And this is very, uh, well, I, let me go to this. This is the outbox method I just mentioned where it's uh, listening to changes and sending those changes to an event store, as I said, it's basically kind of streaming the transaction log in some ways. And then this is the AQ approach um, where AQ is very unique because it's a messaging system in the database. And so you can actually manipulate data and send a message in the same local transaction because it's the same resource manager. So this is completely atomic. Um, so that's, that's the biggest advantage of using AQ. This is some, these are some of the other advantages, including the fact that it's been around for 16 years. We kind of you know, fell into this use case. Um, so it's very nice, especially when you look at uh, microservice patterns, they're always like, what are the top three things when micro writing a microservice? Make sure it's item potent. You can call this method whenever you want. Well, your old code didn't work that way, and that's gonna be a lot of work a lot of times to say that you can call this as many times as you want. You're gonna have to add in like a check on an identifier or something like that. So making it so that you have uh, guaranteed once delivery with no dupes is a huge advantage, and that's, that's what you would get here. Not to mention the more serious scenario where you're sending a message, you manipulate data and you send a message. One of them happens and the other doesn't. That takes major corrective action. And that's, you know, this type of compensating code or admin going in is a nightmare. Um, so now we'll revisit domain driven design in the context of transactions where you want to perform local transactions within a bounded context. So again, we're not bringing in resources from, you know, say sales and support within the, the same transaction. And 
so this data may be spread across multiple services. That's what we're talking about here. Microservice A calls B calls C. You're booking a trip that involves three resources. Something goes wrong. You can't, you know, it's harder. You can't slap an tr at transactional annotation on there anymore. You have to do some more work. So this is the, the basic saga pattern. So this is a, a, a general specification that came out. Again, this is like late 80s or something. And the, 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 um, the long and short of it is that when you are using this business activity with various participants, you're de also desi um, designating a compensating transaction. So you can't just roll back an XA transaction. You need to specify what the compensating action is. So an order was inserted. The compensating action is not to roll that back. The compensating action will be something like, you know, change that order to cancel or whatever the case might be. It's, you know, it's a deliberate action. And of course, you can't, you know, a better example might be, uh, not as critical, but better example might be, you sent that email, you can't roll that email back. You need to send the compensating email that says actually that order didn't go through, that type of thing. So there's just kind of two flavors of Saga. One is the choreography, and that's what I'm gonna show in the demo. That's just when all the services have a well agreed upon uh, business activity. And so they just work it out among themselves. Um, and that's what we have in this order inventory service. That's kind of the, the short description. And then an orchestration is when you bring in a, an orchestrator or a coordinator, uh, and that will basically intercept messages and be responsible for dispatching the messages to do compensating activities. So you actually have, that can be co-located with the service, but it's a dedicated service. Whereas the choreography, like I said, is just between the participants. So uh, again, moving on to a very critical piece is how difficult uh, writing compensating transactions is. This is, um, and so we've come up with some items. Again, this is Oracle database stuff, uh, but you know, just to, to put the concepts out there generically, not, not I'm just trying to sell the database. <laughs> uh, is this feature we had, we're working on the database uh, for automatic compensation um, of data. So what we're doing, it, uh, I can't go into it too much in the time uh, given, but um, we're basically isolating things at an operation level. So you know you have table row. We're actually um, analyzing things and, and isolating them at this operation level based on a new construct called a saga. And so um, when you do a saga abort, the, the inverse of those operations you made is conducted. And so uh, you take away all that compensation logic that you would have in your code and it's automatically handled in the, in the resource. So just real quickly, to, just to kind of give an I idea, the two big advantages in the database are um, the uh, AQ functionality I mentioned as far as messaging and then this automatic compensation. So. This is roughly, and this is very shortened, the difference between using uh, regular Java code and using AQ as far as your messaging logic. You know, you don't have to process dupes or send this data event or anything like that. This is showing the difference between your regular code and if you're using the compensation aware database, you don't need to keep this side table of all the changes you made that, you, that you'll then need to look up and, you know, <laughs> it's, I've been there, it's like a nightmare. Um, and then uh, putting the two together, um, if you're using plain Java and you know, you're know you using this, the compensation aware and the messaging, and then further simplifying with some annotations that we're adding in Halidon, um, where if you're using AQ and the Saga feature in the database, literally you just do your work. And that's what it comes down to. So all this, and this these comments, it, most people give an estimate of when you're writing code like this, it's 80% of your code is compensation logic and 20% of your actual runtime logic. So it's at the very least half, but um, getting rid of all that error prone logic is definitely a problem. So I'll move on to the demo now. It's a seven minute demo, like I say, so I should be pretty much on time. Uh, this is one version of the demo with a um, bunch of different languages and then this is the uh, version of the demo I'm gonna show, which is all Java. So um, it's a online store. It's uh, getting, um, putting things in a shopping cart uh, and it's placing an order. There's a saga um, 
coordinated between the order and inventory service. If the inventory doesn't exist, then the order uh, will be compensated and set to failed. And then we have an X or just suggested sale just to show that CQRS aspect. And then hopefully I have time for maybe a question or two or at lunch. So I hope I don't get groans at the video demo. So <laughs> I know, it's lame. <laughs> it's just easier, I'm sorry. <laughs> I swear, I do have this running live now, though, so if you want to see it at lunch, I will show it. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this is basic shopping cart. Another thing I show in this oops, is just different data types. So this, um, the shopping cart is actually demonstrating GraphQL. So this, I don't know if you're familiar with GraphQL, it's bringing more or less just the information you need from tables. It's dynamic, so you're just making one rest call. You're not doing all this joins and stuff behind the scenes. And um, it works nicely with uh, machine learning. So you can see here, um, you know, w I looked uh, for a pencil, but the top supplier of pencils also has pens, so it'll bring back kind of this, you know, it's learned in the past that some customer would like that, you know, other items from there. And then the shopping cart is just demonstrating the use of JSON. So instead of like relational, uh, you know, queries or whatever, SQL in your microservice, this is just using um, document JSON manipulation. And so there's an Oracle, sim so it stands for Simple Object Data API. Um, and you can use that to manipulate uh, JSON that's stored in the database without using SQL and translating back and forth. So that's all I'm showing here. So we, you just open a collection. Um, and then you just add, add a document to it. So it's, you know, I just show that because that's the more microservice JSON direct way of manipulating data versus plain SQL. Um, so now the, the kind of meat of it, when you submit an order, um, uh, it will check the inventory to see if it exists. And um, if it doesn't, it'll fail. If it, if it does exist, it'll, it'll succeed. So we're gonna place an order here. Does anyone catch the order 66 reference? <sighs> no one ever, that's from Star Wars. And so it was, since we're doing, I never call it out, but I'm always just, you know. <laughs> so anyway, we're doing Star Wars later. So, um, so we'll place this order and then it, I'll bring up the Kiali tool, which again, I love this tool. And it'll show kind of the flow of things. So we see that there was a failed order because I deliberately do not have inventory for the item that we ordered. And so what we see in Kiali, this is what we saw on the slide earlier is the front end um, uh, you know, calling these other services. So it's, it's a little contrived, but the front end calling the shopping cart, you can see in Kiali the versioning, the blue-green deployment there, migrating from the Spring Boot to Held On. Right? And then you can see that there's no direct communication from order uh, to inventory. So this is the event sourcing in CQRS that I was talking about. The front end is communicating directly with the order service. Um, the order service is inserting the order and then sending a message that the order exists. So I have a question. Sure. So you already covered that integration, right? Mm -hmm. So how is it different from Camel? How is it different from? Camel, Camel also doing the service orchestration. Oh yeah, uh, it's, it's related, but it's not the handling all this compensation and things like that. Yeah, so it's this orchestration, but not at a transactional uh, data level like this is, yeah. And this is not using LRA at this point, although I, it could, um, I could, that is something I'm adding to the demo. It's actually using the L microprofile LRA and things like that. So this is just services. Uh, this is a choreography, so this is just services communicating with the messaging and then uh, negotiating a compensating activity based on that. Yep. And
the other thing that we now have is that um, this event provider, provider over here is actually the database. And that's actually connected in the graph now because we have that open tracing that's connecting that um, logically to the database. And the event store now becomes the source of truth, basically. If, if any of these services crash, when they come back or when they first come on or you add services or things like that, they're going to go to the event store to populate their, you know, to, to get the logs, to play back the events and populate their local store with the information that they need specific to that resource. So then the inventory service received that message, it checked its inventory, it saw that it didn't have it for that item and then in turn sends a, uh, that status to the order service. So you have three operations in that one transaction. The message was received, you manipulated the inventory or the order, whatever the case is, and then you sent back the uh, message um, uh, describing the fact that you manipulated it. Now this is the key in AQ, this one line is very unique. You can actually get a JDBC connection, underlying JDBC connection from a JMS session. So this is very unique and this is what allows us to do the messaging and the data manipulation in the same transaction. Comes down to that, that's the most powerful line in, <laughs> in, the, in the demo maybe, as far as, as far as that might guarantee. So then we see the, the message sent in the same transaction again. This is just showing that cloud event form format uh, that we're translating it into. And then back on the inventory on the inventory side, we're picking this up. We don't need to do this is do processing. We would have to do this if we were just using you know straight Kafka or something like that. Um, and then we're checking, as I say, we're checking the inventory and publishing the status of the inventory. Back on our order service, re we're receiving messages about the inventory fail and other messages we're interested in. For example, uh, if there was a suggested sale. So again, I'm demonstrating uh, CQRS here where we're getting events from various different resources without querying down to them. We're just listening to what we care about. So now we'll just add inventory and show a successful order. And the last thing I will show uh, is order details. And this is showing um, command query responsibility segregation, as I'm mentioning. So when we show the order, we only called the order service, yet the order service has information from events that it received from suggested sales, shipping, inventory, et cetera. And so we have all this information by calling a single uh, REST endpoint. And I have two minutes for questions if anyone has any. <laughs> I know it's a lot, I always get like that's too much information, <laughs> so I apologize for that. Sure. So when you are saying you are publishing the service, um, I think one of the services you mentioned and then you are calling that, but you already have um, invoke, uh, I mean those risk points are available, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So all you are doing is uh, kind of um, you have a logic to initiate, meaning you are saying that give me that endpoint and then it returns the JSON, right? Right. So this demo was just uh, going through all that um, kind of a flow. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, just showing and the then flow. showing that, okay, I call this, now it's returning the JSON and then. Exactly. Yeah, yep. okay. And I have a mix, there is a mixed model here. Some of these are direct REST calls uh, and others are event driven. And I kind of like to show all that aspect, you know what I mean? It's not gonna be everything event driven, or you know this and that. So the calls to the order service and the shopping cart are direct rest endpoints. The communication between the order and the inventory is event based. You know. So uh, so when you're saying it is event based, so you are maintaining this event somewhere? How yes. Do yep. So, so this what is your uh, okay, architecture to maintain it? Yeah. So that's in this case, um, I have a few <coughs> different flavors of this. Like I'll have Kafka with the database with a you know Mongo or whatever. I have you know all these different flavors. This one I was showing off the Oracle database. Yeah. 
because it both has the messaging system and the data in there, so it's just very nice for those automaticity, et cetera, features that I mentioned. So in this case, the, um, the database and AQ, same thing, same entity, are the event store and the event broker. But I'm around for sure. Lunch for questions. Thank you, thank you everyone. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we're going to break for lunch now. Please uh, be here uh, back in this room at 1. Thank you.